Well, welcome everybody to the film screening of Sheep's Wool Doesn't Fade, Indigenous Weaving in Peru. We have a full hour planned, so we'll get started. We're honored to have Elder Darlene McIntosh here with us to welcome, to welcome us to Clately Tene territory. Darlene, I'll hand it over to you. Howdy, how's everybody? Um, when I got this invitation to do a traditional welcome to Clately Tene's uh, traditional territories here in Prince George and saw what the documentary film was about, um, I was quite excited about it. I think this is wonderful. And congratulations to you um, and uh, your lovely students. <laughs> and it's it really is so nice to see so many people participate participating on uh, Zoom. It's kind of like a reality nowadays. But in saying that, we know we're all excited and a little bit ungrounded. So just for this moment in time, I'm going to get you to close your eyes. Everybody on Zoom and wherever you are, just close your eyes just for this moment in time. And I want you to take a nice deep cleansing breath throughout your whole body. Nice deep, deep cleansing breath. So as you breathe into your body, you start to let go of all the stresses of the day, the burdens, the fears, the anxieties that you may be carrying. And I just want you to let them go just for this moment in time. As we breathe deep into our body, remembering that the first breath we took was the day we were born. And we don't stop breathing for a long time until it's our time to go to the other world. So as we breathe into our body, we focus on our shoulders, less, lessening the stress on our shoulders. We feel those, those uh, stresses start to release, feel them going down your arms, down your fingertips. And then they drop on beautiful Mother Earth. And there Mother Earth takes those energies and she transmutes them into a positive energy and she hands them back to you for filling your vessel so that you are in a place of focus, grounding and understanding of what will be taking place in the next little while. So just imagine yourself outside early this morning might be a little bit of coolness happening, the wind is blowing, but we, we stand and we face the east direction. And we know that every day in the east direction, the sun comes up. It gives us a new day, a new beginning, and new possibilities. And this we are grateful for. So we take that breath all the way down into our feet and we feel our feet sink into the deep, rich soil of Mother Earth. We can smell the richness of our soil. We can feel it between our toes. And there she grounds us into today, into this very moment, focusing totally on what will be presented to us tonight. It's taken a lot of work, a lot of hard work uh, from the people who put this little documentary together. And we come to honor that situation. So we, the Clayton Tene Nation, have been on our traditional lands over 9,000 years and supported by lithic evidence. The changes have taken place over thousands of years supports the enduring strength, courage, and fortitude of our peoples. Our governance of the Batlats brought balance and harmony with our brothers and sisters of other First Nations people. Clately Tene's clans are Frog, Lasilyu, Grouse, Uzu, Iritsa, and Bear Sus. Through this system, we know who our family connections are. Through our oral history, the use of legends told of our travels, our hunting and fishing territories, our trading practices with all peoples. We remember and hold steadfast in what creators blessed us with, and that is our traditional territories. Our ancestors have always welcomed people to our territories on behalf of Clately Tene's elders, our youth, 
community members and chief and council, it is absolutely our honor to welcome each and every one of you to our traditional territories. All my relations, let's see, thank you. Thank you, Darlene, so much for that beautiful welcome and grounding to territory. Um, so, so my name is Marika Sachs. I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Northern British Columbia. In 2010, I traveled to Peru to carry out field research for my PhD in anthropology. And I was privileged to record the material for this film in 2011 on the traditional territory of the Comunidad Campesina San Juan Bautista de Cañares, the peasant community of St. John the Baptist of Cañares. The Cañarenses are a Quechua speaking indigenous group in, nor in the northeastern corner of the Department of Lambayeque in the northern Peruvian Andes. Everything I did and learned and gained from my time there was possible because of the generosity and friendship of the people of Kenyaris. Many thanks are in order. Just very briefly, I would like to thank Dr. Juan Javier Rivera and Via, who introduced me to key people in Kenyaris and who is here tonight. Aurora Santiago Bernia, a school teacher in Kenyaris and the first person to welcome me into her home. Lydia Waman Berrios and Jose Gaspar Lucero and their daughters, Daisy, Yeni, and Yulisa, with whom I lived in Canaries. And Lucia Bernia Gaspar, who shared her knowledge of plants, traditional medicine, and weaving with me, and who agreed to be recorded for this film. Special thanks also to my amazing research assistants, Cyan Lamole and Jessica Froze who are exceptional undergraduate students at UNBC who did a truly amazing job to edit the recordings into a film in less than three months. Um, finally, this film was made possible with funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council with additional support from the University of Northern British Columbia. I'd like to especially thank the uh, amazing supports of the Department of Geography, Earth and Environmental Sciences, um, the Department of First Nation Studies and the UMBC Arts Council who uh, uh, came together to host this event. We're going to show the film, which is about 16 minutes long. Then we'll hear a little bit from Cyan and Jessica and open up the floor for Q&A. So just bear with us a moment as we get things set up.
tejer he aprendido cuando tenía 13 años. Hilar sí, desde chiquita sí. Ajá. Porque mi mamá reñía para hacer. Porque yo era bien floja. Con mi papá Ajá. me llevaban a chacra a trabajar. Ajá. Todos los días me llevaban a chacra a trabajar y en la tarde hacía hilaria. Y en la noche me ponía a hilar hasta las 10, 11. Y ese era mi trabajo. A los 13 años. Cuando no tenía para mí, yo le hacía, lo agarraba de otra persona para tejer. Lo hacía pagando, pues me pagaban cuando terminaba. Ajá. Sí, me pagaban a veces lana de oveja, a veces me pagaban plata. Ya, ya sabía todo. Cuando 15 años ya sabía todo. Ya. Ah, sí. sí. Yo ya sabía, cuando vi así a mi mamá, ya le aprendía solito ya. Así me enseñaron mi mamá. De ahí yo me acostumbraba ya cuando estoy de edad 18, 20 años, uh, ya estaba bien práctica. Sí, porque en el día trabajaba en el chakra. Ajá. En la tarde, ya me, cuando después de la cena, ya me ponía en mi labia. Ajá. Me decía que tienes que terminar, si no, no duermes, me decía. Sí. Era, así era yo. Échame bien con hilar. Porque ahora las muchachas ya no, ya no quieren hilar. No. Ya no quieren hilar. Quieren todo comprado de la tienda nomás. No sé por qué, qué, por qué será pues. ¿Por qué será? Yo le digo porque de repente tiene plata. De repente pero porque, porque dice que no le gusta, pica mucho, lana dice. Así dice. Es que ya no están acostumbrados a poner. Es que mi mamá me enseñaba eso nada más, es que no me ponían al colegio. Mi trabajo era ese. A mí no me, no me he puesto al colegio ni un año siquiera. Sí, yo quería, pero mi mamá decía, antes los mayores decían, no, ¿para qué hija mujer? Decía, al hijo hombre hay que poner al colegio, decía, así conversaba. Sí. Yo me quedaba pensando, ¿por qué no me quieren ponerlo? Decía yo. Por eso, pues, cuando estoy vieja, yo ya reclamaba a mi papá. Mi vida es feliz, estoy tranquila. Estoy tranquila ahorita. Más me preocupo por mis hijos. Ya. Aquí estoy. Yo no quiero que se queden mis hijos allí nomás. Por eso, pues, a veces tengo que hacer el sacrificio para que estudien mis hijos.
Mi mamá me contaba los pantalones así, dice, los, los hombres así, dice, negro. La, lo hilaba bien finita y tejía y cosía su pantalón, dice, mi mamá. Porque yo ya no lo he visto. Ese señor que ponía, ese, ya, ya se ha muerto, me decía. Uh -huh. Mi mamá sí lo he visto, dice. Así me contaba. Sí, antepasados era así, dice. El poncho hacía, también se ponía blanco, dice. No ¿Sí? tenía, dice. Así blanco también ponía. También ponía ese teñido así con antangue y aliso nada más. Así. Sí. También se tenía en nogal también. Así. Porque mi papá tenía ponche así, como marrón, tenía del, del nogal nomás. No sé, porque ya no quiere, dice. Ya no le gusta más, le gusta andar con casaca, dice. Porque antes los mayores, todos los días se andaba con poncho. No le usaba casaca. Con poncho andaba. Poncho se acababa, hacía otro, se acababa, hacía otro. Por ejemplo, para el fiesta, para el 24, hacía ponchos nuevos. Sí. Eres lan de oveja. Así era antes, porque ahora a los jóvenes hombres también ya no, ya no le gusta poncho. Casi ya no pone. Más le gusta casaca, dice. Se aburre, dice. Así dice. Ya están perdiendo los antepasados.
Más me gustas mis polleras, mis mantas. Es que también es eh, los, los antiguos mayores más tenía lana de oveja. Pues. Por eso también mis antiguos no quiero dejarme. ¿Qué será pues? ¿Qué será? Porque yo estoy acostumbrada con la nadie ver. No puedo dejar ir. A mí me gusta la nadie ver. El otro no me gusta. Porque, porque destino. Sí. Porque la nadie tienda rapidito se destiñe. Por eso no me gusta. Se destiñe. Porque lana de oveja no se destina, así igualito se acaba. <laughs> so um so that's that's the the video we're really keen uh to hear what you thought about it i just um before we hear from uh cyan and jessica and what uh they uh did on this project and what they learned i wanted to show you the actual poncho that lucia made uh which i have with me here today this is <laughs> this is the poncho made from wool from her sheep that she um dyed and spun and wove in the film <laughs> so so this has just been so incredible and we're just so thankful to you and for the opportunity to work on this project um so i guess we're going to talk about kind of our main the main things that we took away um so for me, um, kind of learned that film editing is just such a creative process. It's unique um, and it's exciting, but it's not like a methodical research process. Um, like we're kind of more used to going through. Uh, making a film just requires a totally different part of your brain, um, but it's really fun to be able to switch into that creative headspace kind of in the context of research work. And the enjoyment of that creative process, I think is like a good illustration of how fun disseminating that knowledge can be as well. So I think my biggest learning throughout this project is just the value of disseminating knowledge in different and creative ways through creative research methods, whether that's making a short film um, or poetry or painting. I think creative presentations of research make the work um, more impactful. Um, I think it's really easy to get bogged down kind of with long papers and statistics and reports and that stuff is very useful and important, but creative processes just allow us to see so much more um, and it makes the research just more personal and more meaningful. Um, I think these type of research presentations also make the knowledge more accessible to all kinds of people outside of the scientific community. Uh, my parents probably would have read a report if I sent it to them, but I think they're a lot more keen to come to a documentary screening. Um, you don't have to be an academic to understand and find value in these things. Um, art can be understood by everyone and it can be appreciated and, va and valued um, in ways that papers maybe aren't all the time. Um, basically, 
I think this project and the exposure to all kinds of other arts based projects that this one led to taught me that knowledge created in universities shouldn't stay in universities. Um, this knowledge is for everyone. And then going off of that, um, this project was just such a good learning experience for us um, during our post secondary de like um, degree, I guess, but it also like gave us so much more than um, what our classrooms have. This making this documentary increased our understanding beyond the narrow scope of our project um, to include the community context and values, the importance of the sheep and weaving as so much more than just making textiles. Um, I personally have come to know and love the community of Kinyaris and the people, despite never having been there. Working with the raw video and audio clips to transform them into this film allowed me to have a better and deeper under connection to the culture and the importance of weaving. While visual research is so beneficial to external people, it is also just as arguably um, great to the researcher who wasn't actually a part of um, the fieldwork. Had Jessica and I just analyzed raw data and then formatted a report, the knowledge and value that, we've, that we have may not have had the same impact. Not only was our re experience as research assistants impacted by the visual method um, format that we used, it was also further enhanced by Marika and her willingness to teach us things that were not necessarily related to the film. We learned so much about the culture of Kinyaris through Marika's experience and guidance as she shared her photos, videos, and stories of her time in Peru. And I think that knowledge will be in our hearts for the rest of our education. Wow, thank you, <laughs> Sian and Jessica, for those really um, touching words and reflections. Um, you know, we have we have lots of people here today from um, Prince George, from um, outside of the university, from um, uh, near and far away. Um, please, if I, if you have any uh, questions or, or um, comments or feedback for us now, uh, please um, raise your hand with uh, the reaction function or right in the chat box. Let's see, we have one hand raised here, if I can get to it. I think I can unmute her. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, Gail. Hi, Gail. Hi. I really want to thank all three of you for a really wonderful uh, um, experience that you've provided us with, with uh, um, both the knowledge you've provided and the traveling somewhere, which is such an exotic thing these days. Um, but I, uh, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate that this has really grown out of this uh, working together in a geography course, as I understand. Um, I had two questions, one for um, uh, Jessica and Cyan and the other for Marika. And I'll um, ask Jessica Cyan first, but then I'll suggest that Marika answers first just to give them a teeny bit more time. And I just wanted to ask uh, Jessica and Cyan, you've talked about um, you know, the experience briefly of, of this and the wonderful uh, things you've learned about what we call knowledge mobilization and how important it is to uh, have these different venues, these different means. But um, what was the most surprising or unexpected thing that you learned from this experience? And while you're thinking about that, um, Marika, I just wanted to ask a more technical question. Um, I noticed the beautiful belts that were woven and um, colorful and different patterns. And I was wondering, and, and um, uh, the weaver talked a little bit about colors. Are there colors that are specific or important to families or clans? Or um, is this really self-designed and you do whatever you uh, would like to do for um, your pattern. Oh, great, great question, Gail. Thanks. Um, yeah, I did ask women uh, how they choose the colors that they do in their in their weavings, as well as in their blouses uh, that they sew themselves. Um, and uh, women told me that they choose they like colors that are very vibrant and that have a lot of contrast. Um, so the, the play between the different colors um, is um, chosen by each individual weaver or seamstress and um, 
is, uh, you know, eye catching and uplifting and um, just lively. Um, and uh, yeah, sometimes even like materials for the blouses, the materials with some sheen to them. We saw one photograph with a, a, a blouse that had um, sort of some sparkles to it, like that is like a um, for a special occasion kind of blouse kind of thing, um, more um, light reflecting and um, eye catching. Yeah. But um, in terms of the actual designs on the belts, there's um, a whole series of um, different patterns and they each um, have a different name and a different technique. All the old fashioned patterns are flowers and um, checkerboards and um, little, um, they're called mouse eyes. They're just like little dots. Um, nowadays, a lot of um, women weave words into their belts. So they'll weave their name, where they're from, um, maybe the special occasion that they're making the belt for. Um, Lucia mentioned the 24th of June, which is the feast day of St. John the Baptist. Uh, the patron saint of the town and um, the year's biggest um, festival. Um, so that would be an example. Um, so different pictures of animals and plants as, as well as words are very popular today. As far as our, <laughs> like our most surprising thing, um, personally, I think the most surprising thing um, that I kind of I don't know, I guess realized was how technical filmmaking really is. And like using the proper software and a proper computer to run it is very important. And those are all things that I didn't really um, think about before coming onto this project. And it was a good, really good learning um, experience. It was also a very good experience of um, patience and learning to just work with different systems that aren't comfortable. I'm not a filmmaker. And so I give a lot of credit to filmmakers. <laughs> And I think for me, maybe for more of like a content um, perspective, I just realized like you learn something new um, continuously. Like what I felt like when we first went through the original um, kind of videos and photos that Marika had and she told the stories, I felt like, okay, like I have a pretty good like understanding. This is lovely. I, you know, I feel good about this. And then every time I watched a new video, it was like, oh, well, what is this thing? And then talk to Marika about that. And even like, our last run through of the film, I just noticed another piece of like the weaving process that I didn't quite get before. And so every, you think you know, and then you realize that there's there's just endless learning to be done. So, yeah. <laughs> and I know there's, there's so much more we could have put in about um, the technique of weaving <laughs> or the, history of weaving in um, in the Andes or even what weaving in traditional dress means to people in Kenyaris. Um, but we, we tried to stay as much with what Lucia actually said in the interviews I had with her and um, to uh, uh, keep it in her words and um, keep it a manageable, a, a manageable amount of time, not a full, feature film yet. <laughs> <laughs> We're not quite there yet. <laughs> we do have some comments in the in the chat box. Um, Dr. Juan Javier Rivera says, congratulations, this film is one of the most honest and beautiful documentaries I've watched in a very long time. Hope it will be available on the web to watch it over again, which is Felicity Tastianis de Suid Mira. Nice. Um, oh, he had to leave. Um, <laughs> he's in Brazil right now. So he's in um, uh, that uh, central time zone here. Um, and Dr. Rivera is a Peruvian anthropologist who um, uh, has worked in. Uh, you know, the, the region of Canaries and the neighboring region of Inkawasi for some 15 years. Um, Liz says, so beautiful what traditional plants and what used for dyes, for dyeing. Yes, so in, in the um, film, 
Lucia names the plants that um, her mother told her were used in ponchos. And some of these plants are the ones she used to make this poncho. Um, so it, um, this, this poncho, it, which is sort of a reddish brown color, um, is made with um, the bark and the seeds of two different trees, the um, andanga or radal tree and aliso, which is a type of alder. Um, she also mentioned that her dad used to have a poncho that was brown um, made from walnut and um, that's the, um, it's the Peruvian black walnut. Um, those are very popular colors um, uh, still today, um, like, um, but most women um, make ponchos with industrially dyed threads. Um, so um, very uh, bright red or deep brown. These are very popular colors for ponchos in Kenyaris. And um, women uh, use the, the industrially dyed th threads because the yarn because it's the very vibrant color. And also you can buy it pre-spun um, because the actual spinning of the wool is extremely time consuming and technically very difficult. You have to start learning to do this thing when you are a little girl to, to do it. And even then it, it is work. Um, I knew a lot of women, um, middle-aged and older women who spin all the time, um, but the, um, the younger generations who are still weaving, they don't, they, they don't, I, they don't really spin um, because it, um, it in industrially produced yarn is very accessible. Um, and um, so uh, they, they continue to weave with like that. Um, so Shiva says, looking forward to a full length feature, congrats all. <laughs> But just thinking about Jessica and Cyan doing a kind of weaving themselves, but I imagine in a less systematic kind of way. Any thoughts there? Ah, what kind of weaving? <laughs> also, I was wondering about that soundtrack. Is it specific to the Kenyaris culture and what informs the choice? Mm -hmm. the, the music used in this film um, is an actual audio recording I made <laughs> putting my, tape, <laughs> my my digital recorder up to the radio. And um, it's from the local radio station, which I don't even know if this exists anymore. It was called Radio Heiter. Um, and um, that music is um, a genre of Andean uh, music called wino. Um, and it's in a style that's very typical of this region. It's not the only kind of music that's played on the radio, but it's um, it's sort of um, it's a very traditional genre that of music that has remained popular um, with the incorporation of um, uh, new instruments in that. Um, Hard says, "Real news now. You are." Filmmakers, really quite beautiful and captured his spirit, felt transported through the story. Thank you. That's that's lovely. Oh, we have somebody with their hand up. We'll get you to <laughs> unmute. Hi. Hi. <laughs> First of all, amazing job. It was yeah. such a great video. Um, my, my question is, how long does it take to make a poncho from start to finish? Yeah, good <laughs> question. I, I don't know if I had it written down. It was a couple of months for sure. Did that include like the dyeing and everything? Yeah, yeah, because like those recordings start in November and then I think it's like, no, maybe they start in October. No, and then we're reviewing, I'm reviewing them with Lucia in December. But she's a very capable, um, for a very capable um, weaver um, and spinner um, who's working a couple hours every couple of days. Yeah, at a couple of months. Oh, I think you're muted again. <laughs> yeah, you're, oh, I'll have to get you to unmute again. <laughs> 
Here we go. Again, you guys, it was so amazing. We definitely learned a lot from this video. Thank you. And those women are, I mean, that's just amazing work to see. You don't realize the work that goes into it until you see it in action. So thank you so much. You did such a great job. Yeah. Congrats. Thank you very much. <laughs> um let's see oh amy says congratulations such a beautiful job thank you amy alice says love the film does lucia use other natural dyes we lived in cusco and arequipa nogal is mentioned um i know that she did have other um natural dyes but i don't know what specific plants they were i did have a weaving from her that um had a sort of a mustard yellow to it um and in my other like research i've 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 looked at the um sort of peruvian research on this and there are a variety of plants that are used in lambayeque and cajamarca the 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 neighboring regions in this northern area of Peru um, that um, to, to get colors from brown to red to blue and, and um, yellow. Very interesting that um, that uh, you were in Cusco and Arequipa. <laughs> We have right now the author's. Oh, it's time for me. Okay, we'll see. Um, uh, Gail, um, Gail Fondell, who is um, the acting chair of the Department of Geography, Earth, and Environmental Sciences, says we hope to make the film available for viewing on the Geography G's departmental websites. Yes, we should mention <laughs> it will. So it, this recording in the film itself will be available for viewing later. Belinda says, Lucia indicated that very few people were carrying on cultural traditions, but in the film, it did seem that traditions were alive and well. How much of a concern is the loss of cultural traditions now? What an excellent question. And um, the, the, there's, um, there's not a simple answer to it um, because um, women and young girls do continue to weave and to wear traditional clothing. Um, and on special occasions, men do um, wear ponchos. And you know, um, most importantly, the household economy remains embedded in the countryside on their um, legally defined uh, territory, collectively held um, territory um, where um, the people that Ken, where Kenya Rances continue to produce food for their own family's consumption through um, types of reciprocal labor exchange that are very um, culturally embedded um, uh, within a whole like annual cycle of um, events and um, celebrations and life cycle events and all of that. But at the same time, there's very limited opportunities in this rural district itself. And the majority of young people end up moving to the city um, for um, higher education, for paid employment. Um, there's ex very few opportunities for paid employment in this district. Um, teaching at the local school is one of the only ways, but there are a number of um, members of the indigenous community of Kenyaris that are teachers and that do have some higher education and have chosen to come back. And um, over the past 10 years, they have been especially active in um, uh, cultural revitalization and in passing on particularly important cultural practices to the next generation. Um, and so at the end of the video, there were some photographs, um, and one of the photographs was a man in a poncho playing a flute and a drum. That's actually Lucia's husband, um, Justino, and he is um, 
playing um, these traditional instruments and he's playing a particular type of song on these instruments that is used um, for a dance that is indicative of this indigenous group. It's called the del the dance the, the dance of the bell the bells the dance of the bells, and um, I think it was about five years ago five or ten years ago the um, the community council petitions the um, Peruvian Ministry of Culture to recognize that dance as intangible cultural heritage and um, they have that formal recognition from the Peruvian state now which bolsters their um, uh, indigenous rights, really, um, their recognition of indigeneity in, um, in Peru and um, their uh, uh, unique cultural traditions. Um, so, you know, so, so there's, there's, there's both change and continuity, I guess, is, is the short answer there. <laughs> Zoe says, did you see any hybrid designs in weaving? Were there any weaving in football team names or popular characters? Just wondering about contemporary design influences on weaving. Also, for the students, do you look at woven items differently now? I'll let you think about that a moment <laughs> and I'll um, answer the first part. Um, when, when people said they, they have new, people did tell me they have new weaving designs for belts. But they're like they were particular pictures of animals and plants, and also um, written words, um, and um, and I think like like new colors too, um, new color combinations was a thing too. And um, uh, weavers would tell me that that they would see such weavings in neighboring districts and with other indigenous groups who also speak Quechua and also do weaving, but have um, distinct um, identities. And, um, and yeah, but it's an interesting question. I didn't, I, I, I didn't see any weavings that in, incorporate um, the other elements of people's dress, as you could see, like it's very typical for men to wear pants and um, a polo shirt, a, a football jersey, um, a t-shirt kind of thing. Um, I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure it's just a matter of time <laughs> for that to happen. For us? Yes. I, I think I always kind of like admired weaving mm -hmm. and like enjoyed it, but kind of as a textile and like, I don't know, appreciated that it was beautiful, but didn't appreciate the cultural significance and the, I guess, regional differences between weaving and yeah I guess the history and the time that it takes to go into these products and yeah so I think I always liked it but on kind of a surface level and it's just been like a lot more deepened I guess. I agree and also <laughs> I think that I notice weaving so much more now because it's brought to my attention like like Jessica said I always appreciated it but now I just really notice and value it to a deeper level. <laughs> And I should point out that there's like that weaving is is highly technical like it's a mathematical function to figure out how much thread you need to lay out on those sticks on the ground to set up the loom and. Um, uh, and how and how to actually tie each thread in to different parts. Of, of the loom that allows the weaver using a backstrap loom to um, uh, lift up a, a, the uh, top layer of threads, um, bring through a, a weft um, yarn, and then exchange that, change, um, bring the, the top up. And so all of that, it's, it's a machine, it's a machine using yarn that a woman makes on the spot that she has learned how to make by watching other women do it many times. It's incredibly technical. And I personally only really gained a little bit of um, competency in belts because belts are like that wide. And so they're much easier to manipulate um, 
um, a loom that is the width of the weaver's waist is, is actually, it's quite heavy. You need a lot of um, strength to hold it up and to lift it up. And um, it's just a lot um, technically very difficult also to keep everything even and straight. Um, so yes, this very, it's a, it's a very ancient technology that um, is nonetheless very complex. Um, Louise says there are more and more people in Canada dying wool using natural products, plants, etc. I think there will be a lot of interest in this film at Fiverr festivals. Wow, thanks, Louise. That's really interesting. Should think about how to um, make this film accessible <laughs> to other groups of weavers. Shannon says, as a novice Métis weaver who literally just weaves for fun now and then, I can't get over the fact that these artisans can finish a poncho in mere weeks. It's truly amazing and just so technical. No questions here, just gratitude. <laughs> ah, okay, Max. still, it's amazingly fast. I would agree. Yes, I would agree. And um, weaving is labor, but it's also something that women do in the afternoons um, in their very long work days where when they can take some time for themselves to sort of rest and relax in their backyards um, and maybe converse with their sisters or good friends. Um, it's one of the, even though they're um, working at doing something, it's one of the few times that I saw women relaxing. Men, you'll see relaxing a lot more, <laughs> loitering on street corners, and whatnot, um, but women are always busy from like before dawn, waking up to start fires, to get breakfast ready, to take sheep out to pasture, feed children, get children to school, go to the field, you know, um, and um, uh, weed or plant or clear, um, or um, clear new fields by hand and the easily 12 hour days consistently. So um, um, weaving is something that in this region only women do and they do it for the benefit of their families to weave things that are useful for family members but they also do it for themselves. Lowell says, thank you for sharing. Great, great job, ladies. Thanks. <laughs> Mark says, that was a lovely story. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Parent <laughs> says, excellent job. Jessica, Cyan, and Marika, congratulations. <laughs> oh, thanks, Farron. <laughs> Zoe says, oh, thank you. And the UMBC Arts Council, thanks you for such a rich film and discussion. Thanks for having us gather around this film to learn together. Um, I mean, one more comment from Mackenzie says, Lucia mentioned how important the ponchos and blankets are to their traditional culture. Does Lucia and other weavers in her community trade or sell their items outside of their community, commodified into global markets, for example, or are they made primarily for one another in their community? Such a great question too, which I'll just um, <laughs> deal with them quickly as our last um, um, uh, question for the night. Um, when I was in Kenyari's in 2010 to 2012, um, I bought as many weavings as possible um, <laughs> because um, from women who wanted to sell them because this was one of the few opportunities women had to um, have access to their own money. Um, uh, seasonal labor migration is very common for young people as well as for men very uncommon for women who are primary caregivers and for young children, as well as the homestead. They are the ones that are caring for the animals and the fields in between the major um, planting and harvesting seasons. They're always there. And, um, uh, but women do need money. They need, um, they need money um, for, for, for medicines, for um, basic household supplies like oil and rice. Um, they need money to um, buy material to make their blouses 
or yarn to um, weave with industrially produced wool. Every family does need access to some money. So um, this area is, um, it's very difficult to get to. It's um, a, a two days journey from the regional capital. It's a four hour drive from the nearest highway town. And it also, there's very few trucks that do that um, dirt path route. And it also costs money to get a ride in that truck. Um, so um, women tried to um, uh, produce um, some cash crops that they could sell to market. Like um, the woman that I lived with, her family, Lydia, she grew um, passion fruit um, that was specifically to sell to market, but there were very few opportunities for her to actually bring it there. This town itself doesn't, even though it's the district capital, it doesn't have a market where people come to sell stuff because basically it's it's quite remote and difficult to get there. Um, so um, now I'm talking over my time, but um, in the 10 years since I've, I've um, been able to return, the women themselves have started a weaving collective. And, um, and it seems like that organization, if it's still active, that it is oriented to um, connecting women to the market so that they would um, be able to um, have some supplementary income. But I would suspect that nevertheless, the primary reason women would continue to weave would be for themselves and their families. Can we see those um, ending remarks? Oh, sorry. Right, so <laughs> now we, we have um, come to the end of our hour. Um, <laughs> the response to this film has been incredible. Uh, if you would like to connect again, okay. uh, you can email me. Um, I'll put my email in the it. chat box. Oh, thanks, Cyan. Great. So you can email me at my uh, university address. Um, thank you, everybody, for your interest in this film and for your comments and engagement tonight. Uh, we'll have to sign off for now. Take care and have a good night. I know. <laughs> <laughs> She's trying to see.